This is Jonathan Ferguson, the keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armies Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this episode, he's looking at the World War II era weaponry of the tactical shooter, Hell Let Loose. So this is the PTRS-41. It's hard to convey, I think, how enormous this thing is. If you're interested in seeing more World War II era firearms, make sure to check out our videos on Battlefield 5 and Call of Duty World War II. If there are any other games, guns and mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comment section below. And if you'd like to help out the Royal Armies Museum and continue to support Jonathan's work, check out the links in the description of this video. Right, over to Jonathan. Okay, pause. Well, we're off to a good start there with the Browning Automatic Rifle, the M1918A2. This is well modelled, well implemented. I think uh, they're running on the slower of the two rates of fire. It makes you realise listening and listening to that and watching it how you know a, a well-trained soldier firing rapidly you know, on semi-automatic can easily match that sort of low 400 rounds per minute or 300 and something I think it was. The other sort of minor nerdy detail is the lack of the carrying handle which is also correct because most of the A2s you'll see now as well as probably having their bipods will have a carrying handle on them which is another kind of moving toward like machine gun thing. Um, well, that feature was not fitted during the Second World War. So these guys have done their research. It's well modeled, it's well represented. Apparent recoil rate of fire, all of that seems to be pretty good. And the effect on target as well, you know, firing bursts, short bursts of twos and threes, as you probably would be doing, and the enemy's going down. So there's none of this bullet sponge nonsense. Are getting a medic on the team. The classic MG34, looking good so far. Okay, so we've got uh, two MG34 gunners here. I suppose uh, an ongoing quirk of video game bipods is that they don't really engage with the game world <laughs> as they perhaps ought to. Um, it has to be fudged to allow you to place the gun and move it around. So our second gunner that we see here is floating in space because he's he's in the prone animation but he's on a sloped surface and it doesn't quite work. But it gives us a good view of the in-game MG34, which is looking good, I think. Looks a little short there, I think that's probably just uh, perspective. The position and hold of the gun, which is you know something you've got to pay attention to when you're modeling something like this, looks right. I mean, I don't have a, a German manual to hand or anything, but it looks period correct. The house. These are going up. Nice. Right, so we're going house to house now, or into a house, and the gunner is holding the bipod legs together as a sort of improvised forward grip, which, as far as I know, was done. You need something to be able to hold on to. That cooling jacket isn't going to stay cool for very long, not with a 900 rounds per minute plus rate of fire, which is, um, again, correctly implemented as far as I can, as far as my ear can discern. Uh, we've got the, the Degturov machine gun, the DP. This is the second light machine gun I've seen, and it looks like they're preventing you from shouldering the thing, from, from aiming using the sights while shouldering the gun, which is realistic in, in large part, and prevents you from just running around, running and gunning like it's an assault rifle, which is, I suspect is the main reason they've done it. So I do approve of that, but you will always find stories of absolute units that would shoulder a Bren gun or something similar, similar size and weight to this, and actually use the sights. If you had sufficient upper body strength, you could fire this, this thing from the shoulder. But I, I definitely approve of that as a gameplay choice because it reflects the real world use of the thing. Yes, you can hip fire it. Yes, we're gonna see more hip firing than we should in a game. And the primary role is from the bipod. And that's what we're seeing most mostly here in the footage. Reloads look good on the DP. All I would say, and this is true of almost any light machine gun, but especially one with a big cumbersome pan magazine like this, is that reloading on the run, as we saw just now, just not possible. You can't run with a big heavy gun like this. And you know, maybe, maybe unless, unless your assistant gun is running alongside you and handing you the, the mag, and then even then getting that located on the gun one-handed and properly seated. Well, I'd like to see someone try, put it that way.
We've got the, the German Car 98K, as we'd expect to see in a Second World War shooter. Some interesting gameplay there, quite a straightforward um, scenario where we've got an enemy soldier that's somewhat zigzagging toward the shooter, who with a bolt action rifle is desperately trying to score a hit. Of course, with a self-loading rifle, you could fire more rapidly and ensure that you scored that hit. And of course, that totally reflects reality. This is a limitation of the, the weapon that's being modeled. It's a bolt action rifle. What are you going to do? There's only so fast that you can fire this thing. So I'm intrigued to know how it plays. Perhaps, you know, let us know in the comments how frustrating it is to go up as the Germans against an enemy that might have a self-loading rifle. We've got the M1 carbine. The recoil looks a little excessive to me. The 30 carbine is a sort of glorified pistol cartridge, really, and does not produce a huge amount of felt recoil, even in a, a light carbine like the M1 carbine, which matters, of course, in terms of your dispersion of fire. That might have been done deliberately to balance the thing. So something I think I'm picking up on here is that where, as you move, and I've seen this on a couple of recent games, the, the iron sights are moving in relation to each other as, as they would. And I would assume that when you are pulling the trigger, the bullet's going wherever the front sight is pointing. So you actually do have to take account to some extent of what your sight picture is. Maybe that doesn't pan out in the gameplay at all, but it, it got me thinking. And it's one of the main things missing for, for enthusiasts like me, where sight alignment and, and sight, well, sight picture, fine. You can, you can, you have to get a sight picture to hit where you're aiming at. You have to lead your target, all of that. But sight alignment is not usually a consideration. There aren't enough controls on a controller, or you, know, you can't really get your fingers around uh, the controls to both realistically aim a weapon and point your upper body and move your feet and do all of that within a game. Our old favourite, the M1 Garand, or Garand, or M1 Rifle, if you'd rather avoid the pronunciation issue. Looks pretty good so far, but right out of the gate I noticed, and I happen to have one of ours here, that it's, and I won't say suffering from, but has the same issue as just about every other Second World War game that's had the features of the Garand, in that the rear sight aperture is absolutely massive. So the one on the real gun is one and a half mil, something like that, but it's a much smaller aperture, and that is, that is what allows you a degree of precision in the use of iron sights. It, it focuses you right down on the front sight. They, they must have done this deliberately, as have um, Call of Duty, Battlefield, everyone else who's ever done the Garand, because your sight picture would be so cluttered as to be frustrating. I think that's the reason why, but it does mean that it's slightly inaccurate. A bit of a myth about the, the M1 and the fact that you can't top it off, you can't add more ammunition, but I think what they're getting at when they make that criticism is that you have to eject whatever's in the gun and load a complete eight round clip. But in fact, that's not the case. With a bit of practice, you can eject the clip, retain it in the weapon, insert extra rounds into the clip and push the clip back into the, the rifle. What we see here is the, well, it's one, it's one up from the games that wouldn't let you even eject a clip. We've moved on from that, but we're also throwing away a partial clip to make matters worse, actually what's happening is, uh, regardless of how many shots the guy's fired, a full clip of eight rounds is what's flying out of the gun. So that's just, a, that's just an oversight that I'm sure will be addressed at some point. I almost feel bad for pointing it out. So A, you wouldn't waste valuable ammunition, and B, you don't magically reacquire all eight rounds, because if you could do that, you'd just leave them in the gun, I think. Side of the tank by the trees. We have our, our friend the Mosin rifle. So the, the rifle and its scope look pretty good to me. Um, there's a glaring issue with the reticle, which is correct. It's the, the three post, one 
pointed post and then the two either side. That's the correct reticle. But the fact that the reticle is stays still as the scope and the and the rifle recoil once you once you notice it is extremely distracting and it's just an oversight. I'm sure they will improve that in due course. But suffice to say that the reticle at this era is on a piece of glass that is inside the scope and should be moving with the scope. The, I think more interesting than the representation of the rifle here is the way it's is the way it's being used. So we've got I don't know if this happened organically or if it was planned, but we have the sniper with his Mosin, and we actually have a spotter, another player, who is uh, working with the sniper, lying in the grass with him, using much more powerful binoculars, and, the, and it's certainly this era they are more powerful than the standard sniper scopes, to see what's going on at distance and identify targets, working as a sniper spotter pair. And the Second World War was really the, the origin of that modern practice of having two-man sniper teams. But it's just nice to see some gameplay that uh, reflects real military doctrine because it works in both realms, you know, it makes sense. Low magnification of the scope means you either have to make do and be less effective or someone helps you out with a pair of binoculars. I have to say, the uh, the PPSH or Papasha, whichever you prefer, 41, looks like a lot of fun to use in this game. It's a combination of the, the very high rate of fire, but also controllability. So that 762 by 25 cartridge is kind of the sweet spot for ballistic effectiveness and low recoil energy. Now, I like the fact that the player is actually is cupping the drum off to the side, which is how it was actually shot. With the, with the drum fitted, because you can't really hold it otherwise. Extremely awkward to perform the reloads with this. It's always going to be easier to just press a button and watch it happen than to, than to fumble with it in real life. So the, the feel of this is really good. I think the re they've kept the recoil, the, the sort of perceived recoil low. You can, with a bit of uh, mouse control, clearly keep the reticle on target for an entire magazine, which you absolutely can do with the, with the Papasha. So that's great. But we also see that the player is defaulting mainly to short bursts, which is still more effective. Um, yeah, if you're kicking in a door or something, you might you might give it a long burst. But for, for effectiveness and ammo conservation, you want to be firing short bursts, which in this with this thing is, you know, delivering three to five rounds of 7.62 at a very high rate. Uh, counterpoint to the Papachart is the German MP40, which they seem to have nailed, I have to say. So it's got that slow, deliberate rate of fire, but very low recoil. I mean, that thing must be the, the lowest recoiling submachine gun that I know of. It just kind of sits there chugging away, uh, largely because it has a big telescoped spring buffer in the receiver that slows that bolt group right down. It's a good implementation. The MP40 is iconic enough that people are going to notice if you if you get it wrong. It looks good. It works well. I am. Um, I know. I'd rather have the PPSH though. <laughs> So this is the PTRS 41. It's hard to convey, I think, how enormous this thing is. And I don't think, and it's not the game's fault, but I don't think you really get the sense of how big and heavy it is either. Yeah, no, these, these things absolutely did get used against personnel. What we see here is a some poor sap in the open getting engaged by the PTRS and they go flying like a like a skittle. I still don't think that would happen the way we saw it. He was a bit too ragdoll there. In reality, this thing is traveling at such velocity that it's certainly not gonna do you any favors, but it's gonna zip through you. But with 14.5, we're getting to the point where you actually are getting knocked off your feet, potentially by around that big and heavy. It's as close as you're gonna to get to the classic movie flying through the air thing. The STG, Sturmgewehr. This is looking good, except that I've just realized I don't believe you can change fire mode. That very good long range shot there, so at least you can perform those, would have had to have been a tap of the button, which is fine. 
but you'd be able to focus a bit more on trying to use it as a rifle if you were able to switch it to semi-automatic only and it would be more faithful to how the gun is actually operated. Having said that, um, if it's too good a rifle, an infantry rifle substitute, you're really going to make the Car 98, uh, players hate the Car 98. So maybe that's a conscious choice to, to make you exercise a bit of your own trigger control to pull off single shots. So I'm not sure how the game implements the, the issue of this rifle, as it were, but due to sort of limited quantities and some tactical reluctance for, from the German armed forces, especially Hitler himself, the STG ended up issued to assault platoons. Um, so, so almost everyone in that unit would have a Sturmgewehr. Now, for a game like this, you kind of do need to limit the availability of this thing somehow. Otherwise, everyone will just have it. Or you have to nerf it really badly because you have to make the other weapons worth using. Thompson, of course, has to make an appearance in this context, and we have the M1 or M1A1. In this case, though, it's wrong, because the sight protector is okay, but the sight within it is a weird sort of square U-notch, and I don't know where they've got that from, because the sight on the M1 and the M1A1 is a simple L-shaped piece of metal with a round aperture in it. It's possible they've chosen this to increase the player's field of view in the iron sights, but I don't think so because the sight they've chosen instead is much wider than the actual sight on the gun. And if they just wanted to increase field of view, they could have just lopped the top off the proper narrow sight that should be there. I don't know if it's just perspective, but it seems the gun seems a little small in the player's hands. Uh, scaling is an issue with 3D models in games. In the aim, this looks about right, so I, I, it could well be perspective, but the whole gun seems a little slight for me. The Thompson is, is a large, heavy gun. Thank you. It should be directly 3 ton. Um, we've got a, a series of firearms videos over on the Royal Armouries channel that you might like to check out as well. Up in the description of this video there are links to our donation scheme and also our membership scheme here at the Royal Armouries Museum if you'd like to support the work that we do. Either way I'll see you again next time.